All the kids are dismissed. Uh, if you could head for uh, to children's worship, children's Bible study, it goes that way. I don't know the exact words, but here we go. <laughs> No magic words? Uh, I used to be a professional at this. Can you imagine? <laughs> Good morning. I'm glad to see y'all. My name is Miles Newton. Um, I'm an elder in the church. Um, that's mostly due to my advanced age, but you know, that, that qualifies. Um, but, but we are really pleased to see you. We're glad you're here. Um, if you're here for the first time, I'm just so glad you're here. Uh, I just appreciate it. As, as many of you know, I, uh, I, used to, I lived a long time in California. And um, I know. Uh, <laughs> But despite the humans there, the California itself is truly a magnificent place. Um, I've already left my notes, but that's all right. Um, like one time, this is true, this is what you can do in California. I went snow skiing, went down the mountain, went to the beach on the same day, and both were comfortable. And this is, there's just no place in the world like that. Anyway, let me tell you some about, some about California. For example, the highest place um, point in, in the continental United States and the lowest point in all the United States is in California. Both. And believe it or not, it's in the same county. So you can imagine the topographical map of that area. So um, uh, Mount Whitney's 14,500 feet above sea level. Death Valley sinks to below 280 feet below sea level. So it's, it's, it's just it's a crazy place. California is home to the oldest living thing in the world. Well, it used to be. I, I, I live here now, but it used to be. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, 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 the bristle, the bristle cone pine tree in California, the Methuselah tree is over, over uh, 4,800 4, years old. They've actually in the core of another tree that they hide because they think people are going to come see it too much. Over 5,000 years old. Only place that lives in California, the, 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 this tree. It's home to the tallest trees in the world. Again, they only live in California, not even Oregon. The coast redwood. Can you picture a tree that's almost three times the height of a Bailey building at, at Wallace? I mean, these trees are truly, you're just like, oh my God. Um, and on and on it goes. The highest waterfalls are all in California, so on and so forth. But there's one more that's going to introduce us to our topic. The largest living thing on Earth grows only in California, the giant sequoia trees. Now, they're not quite as tall. They're only about twice as tall as the Bailey Building, as opposed to three times as tall. But they are massive, huge things. The current, uh, the current one that's the largest is called the General, Sh in the General Sherman. But in the 40s, there used to be one that was 25% bigger, which is hard to imagine. And apparently back in the early 1900s, there were a couple before people cut them down that were larger still. But let me just show you about the General Sherman. It's about 2,500 years old, about 280 feet tall, about, about, about twice the, the Bailey Building is roughly. The diameter of this thing is over 25 feet at about four and a half feet off the ground about here which means that 13 of me, the circumference is over 70 feet, 13 of me cannot reach around this tree. 13. Can you picture a tree that big? One, two, three. Can you picture it? These things are just incredible. You have to see them to, to, to believe them. They have all sorts of cool features about them too. They're, they're thick, um, the thick bark that prevents them from getting burned in fires and so forth. Here's one more stat and then we'll get to it. The first branch of this tree, the trees go up and you get your first branch, the first branch is over 130 feet tall. At, comes out 130 feet, about the size of the Bailey building. So imagine a tree that's next to Bailey and the first branch comes out at the top. Uh, can you follow? And that branch is so big that there's not a tree east of the Mississippi whose trunk is as big as that branch. Can you picture that? Three of me could not reach around the branch. These trees are awesome. You have to go see them someday. California, again, is the place, only place in the world where you find these trees. Now here's the thing on the giant sequoias. This is the point. You will never find one alone. They only, only, only grow in groves. There's no such thing as a lone sequoia. It doesn't happen. The reason why? The root system is very, very shallow, extremely shallow, that, that they were surprised with back in the day when they figured this out. And so they have to grow in groves because they support each other. That if you don't have your friend supporting you, your sequoia friend, you will not live to be 2,500 years old, and you will not live to be 200 feet tall. There's no such thing as a lone sequoia. So as we continue our series called Word Up, that is, that is a morphism, isn't it? Word Up. Um, this week, the word, of course, is, is, is unity. You see it there on your outline, on your bulletin. And while unity is not often talked about compared to big things like discipleship or evangelism or faith or love, right? 
It's, it's not a big topic. It comes up a lot. I, uh, biblically, it's actually quite important, as we will see. We also don't talk about unity in terms of our personal growth. You know, you know we think, as you think, if you want to grow in Christ, you think of fancy words like sanctification or discipleship or maybe something simple like being like Christ or maturity, right? We think in these kind of terms. And as Americans, I'm leaving my notes again, forgive me. As Americans, we, we believe the seat of reality is the individual. That's not true in, in, in other cultures. That's another sermon. Um, but we don't think about unity because that's not an individual thing. That's a group thing, is it not? I mean, it's easy to be unified alone. I agree with myself almost all the time. I mean, it's almost 100%. But, it, but in a group, it's a, it, it, it's a different game, is it not? So, so it's not something that we talk about a lot. So one thing we do talk about a lot, though, is what we'll see this morning is the path to unity, because that's an individual thing. So um, we'll talk about that just a little bit later. So what I'm going to do this morning is, is look at s several scriptures, especially Ephesians 4. So if you want to turn to Ephesians 4, you can turn to all of them, but you have to be fast. But if you want to turn to Ephesians 4, we'll be there the longest. And, uh, and after seeing what those scriptures... Uh, say about unity, I hope you'll come away with a renewed understanding of, of this unity thing. Because again, we don't talk about it very much. All right. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just begin with some simple definitions, then we'll go through our passages, and then we'll make some, uh, hopefully, a kind of inspirational conclusion. So let's just lay out what unity is and what it's not. Now, now don't write this down. And, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're a note taker, this is one to put the pen down, just, just for a moment. I just want you to, to hear this, which I thought was really cool, but it's, it's long. Unity, Christian unity, is that unique grace of the Holy Spirit which allows believers from all ethnicities, nationalities, personalities, and backgrounds to be of one heart, mind, and spirit in our love for Jesus Christ and our commitment to the gospel. That's cool. I, could, I couldn't repeat that if I tried, but it's cool. But more simply, if you want to write this down, unity is when believers work together harmoniously for the cause of Christ. That one you can write down. You can. It's when we work together harmoniously. That's why it's not a solo thing. It's, it, 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 it's a group thing, community, right? And it is, is indeed a grace given by God when people, especially diverse people, can find some way to work together harmoniously. And I want to mention just quickly what's, what's not unity. And I don't mean things like disharmony, fighting, chaos, tension. I mean, that's obvious. But I mean things that appear to be unity but aren't. You know, kind of counterfeit unity. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? Um, I'll just go ahead and put, put them up there. False unity is conformity or uniformity. That's not to say that just because you conform, you're not unified with something, or that just because there's uniformity, there's not, not harmony. But by themselves, those aren't it. Do you understand what I'm saying? These are often mistaken for unity. A conformity, where everybody's kind of in lockstep, you know, the, the, the Russian soldiers, I don't know what they do. Um, or, or, or uniformity, or everybody's kind of the same. That's a false unity if that's the only thing that holds people together. So just a couple, couple definitions, okay? So, so far, so good? So kind of on the same page. Now let's go to the Bible and see what God sees, how vital it is in God's eyes. We can slow down just a little bit. So uh, the first one is in Galatians chapter 3. If you want to go ahead and put that up there. This is our first passage. We're just going to see unity in all these passages, okay? For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And here it comes. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And you can only imagine the conflicts that happened in a normal society back then between the men and the women, the Jews and the Greeks and the slaves and, and the free, right? So, so Paul is trying to say, hey, let's get together here because our unity, because you can go ahead and put this up, our, our unity is based on our identity in Christ. So when you see someone who's a, a brother or sister in Christ and they are different from you in some way, like in my case, if they have hair, or a female, or a black person, or somebody who's rich, or somebody who's poor, or somebody, somebody who's big, small, well, whatever's different from me, and I see them as different, I'm not looking at them right. What I should see is, ah, oh, that person was saved by Jesus just like me. And that's the identity that counts. Paul says, the Bible says, you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's what unites us. And that one idea, by the way, could be a whole sermon in of itself, and I promise I, I won't preach it this morning, but it's, but it's a, a passage we don't take seriously enough. According to the Bible, this passage and others, Christian brotherhood exceeds all other relationships. 
father, son, husband, wife. But that's not how we live and that's not how, how we believe. We put, we put family first, we put marriage first, we put blood relations first, and then the church. I'm not gonna go there this morning, but I'm just saying, okay? So we'll just skip that for now. <laughs> Unity is based on our identity in Christ. Let's do the next one, uh, uh, First Corinthians. I'll look at this one. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, it's always in Jesus' name, right? That you all agree and that there be no divisions among you. Let's just stop right there. But can we all admit that's not going to happen? So can we just admit it? But that's the goal. Okay. But that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment, for I have been informed, and here is the problem that brought this up. I have been informed concerning you, my brothers and sisters, by, <laughs> you notice he calls them brothers and sisters, there's that Christian unity thing, uh, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels of, among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am with Paul, or I am with Apollos, or I am with Cephas, or I am with Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul said, what are we talking about here? Paul was not crucified for you, for you, was he? And by implication, neither was Apollo, so see this. Well, why are we talking about these people? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You understand? Clearly not, right? Do you understand what he's saying? Why should we be divided because this guy led you to Christ, or this church does this or that? Let's be one, and let's not get to these kind of divisions. The dumbest thing in the world is us fighting over who's the, who's the better leader of a church, right? That's just dumb. And Paul's saying, stop it. Quit quarreling because you're all one in Christ. And I want you to notice something subtle here. If, if you could go back uh, uh, one slide. Mitchell, by the way, is, 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 he's my hero. I just want you to know that. Uh, here's the last part here. But that you be made complete in the same mind and the same judgment. Not all translations have it that way, but that you be made complete. Just keep that one in your mind. We'll talk about that just a, just a little bit later. It, it, it's kind of a, a big deal in further, further verses. But I just want to say that unity makes us complete. I think that's two slides up. Unity makes us complete. If you're taking notes, unity makes us complete. Again, we'll talk about more on this later, but keep that in mind. It turns out to be a pretty big deal. Now onto our main passage. We're just going to go through them, and then we'll get colorful at, at the end. Is that fair? All right. I turn, to, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And I just want to read the whole thing. And one problem we have in churches that I've observed is that we take such small s s snippets, and I'm guilty of it today too, so small pieces, um, that we kind of miss the whole thing. Does that make sense? So let's just read the whole thing through, just kind of, and then we'll go back and take it, take it in, the, in the pieces. So uh, this is a long one, so hang in there. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. With all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's the thing. Now, to details. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you also was called, were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Keep going. But to each of us, even though there's a one, here comes the diversity, right? To each of us was given, according to the measure of Christ's gifts, to each of us grace was given. Therefore it says, verse 8, when, okay, this part, verse 8 and verse 9, is just a parenthesis. Next time through, I'm not even, I'm not even going to read it. It's its own sermon itself. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he, Jesus, he led captives to captives, and he gave gifts to people. Now this expression, again, it, oh, there's even a parenthesis. He ascended. What does it mean that also that he descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is himself also ascended far above all things in heaven, so he might fill all things. And you almost get the first, I, I, I just wish I could, you almost get the impression Paul goes, okay, I've lost track of what I was talking about. And he jumps right back. So let's, let's go to the next verse. And he gave some as apostles. Now back to the whole thing he was talking about. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors, some as teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain, here's that word again, the unity of the faith. So this whole passage is about one thing. It's about unity. And the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, 
We are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects of him who is the head, that is, Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted together and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. That's a big passage. And a lot could be said about that passage. Kind of get an amen about that. So you say amen. amen. Oh, come on, you go. Thank you. That's a big passage. But what we see here is, um, let me go back here. What we see here is that Paul's making a big deal for these guys to get together. And explains how it can happen in, 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 in kind of a way. So, so, so um, uh, Let's go ahead the first part again so we can kind of break it down a little bit. Let's go to Ephesians 4, 1 through 6. All right. Now we're slowing down. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of calling which which you have been called, with all humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then there's one body, one spirit, one. In, all I've written, in light of all I've written in the first three chapters, therefore, right, therefore, based on the stuff I've written, I urge you to be unified. That's what he's saying. Does that make sense? Say so yes. Yeah? How? This is the how. This is kind of the good part. With all humility and gentleness and patience and then being diligent. That's how. But first, I want to just say our unity, and I, I kind of, on your things, I wrote it wrong. It would be wrong on here, too. So go ahead and put the... Our unity is aligned with, is what it's supposed to say, my bad, but just cross it out, is aligned with our makeup, our composition, our constitution. And you don't have to write all three of those. None of those words say what I'm trying to say, but they're all synonyms. So write whichever one makes sense to you. Our unity is, is based on our makeup, our constitution, our how we're put together. I mean, there was no good word that, that wasn't clear to me that would... For instance, if you just wrote, our unity is based on, or, or is aligned with our constitution, one might think, our church constitution? That's not what I mean. It's how we're made up, how we're designed, what we're made of. So whatever makes sense to you to say that, that's what I want you to write. So we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this stuff later, but it's based on, aligned with, I should say, because I keep making a mistake, it's aligned with who we are, actually. How God designed us from the very beginning. The purpose, the way of what... Why God made the earth and us and how he put all the... That's, that's what a unity comes from. And then, and then oh, let's go to the next part. We'll get back to the humility and gentleness in a minute. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. And we're going to skip this and go to the next one. And here are the gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists. Why were these gifts given? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry. Why? For the building up of the body of Christ. Why? Until we attain unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man and the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Would you like to have the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ? That's a pretty high goal. Can you say yeah with that? That's a pretty high... Sh that's He's setting the bar pretty darn high there. First things first, go ahead and put it up. Unity is expressed through diversity. He didn't say, and now, in order to, to, to diligently seek this unity with humility, let's all be the same. He said quite the opposite. He gave us different things so that we could be unified. I mean, if you think about it, put on your thinking cap. If we were all the same, unity would be pretty easy. Would you agree? It would be pretty easy. But if we're all different, ah, then unity is a challenge. That make sense? And that's what he's saying here. Hey, uh, I'm urging you for unity because you, have, you are aware of the fact that you are diverse. That there are different gifts. Different people. So go back and put the, the, the verse back up the one before this. Here's the question. Again. All those gifts are for the purpose of building up the body of Christ, right? You see that in verse 12? For the building up of the body of Christ. Why? And I think this is so key. Until we attain unity. That's the purpose. I had never really truly noticed that before. 
I sort of stopped at the building up of the body of Christ, and I thought, well, so that we could all be mature. Yeah, that's in there. There's a maturity. There's, but the first thing is until we all attain unity. That's the, that's the, if you get there, then you are mature. So, so, so follow the flow. God gave gifts to people to use to prepare others for the works of, of service. Those works of service will be used to build up with the body of Christ. The body of Christ is to be built up so that we can all reach the unity of faith and all those other good things. The purpose of the gifts, the reason why there's such diversity, and the reason why you're gifted. By the way, you are all gifted. There are a lot more gifts than those. That was just a representative sample. The purpose of your gift is to build up the body to be a Christ-like in full measure, and that's unity. So put, put, put up the unity one, the next one. It's part of maturity or completeness. Remember how we read the word complete before? You are not a mature Christian if you're not part of a unified body. You're just not. You're getting there. But let me say it a different way. It's hard, relatively speaking, it's hardly a challenge to be holy in a room by yourself. You could do that. I know it's hard, but you could conceivably do that. But when you start running into other people, <laughs> you're not the problem. I mean, how do people say that they go to France? I love France, but all the French people are there. You know, that kind of thing. I'm not picking on France. But it's, the trouble is living together, isn't it? Isn't that the problem? I mean, by yourself, you could kind of almost do it. But man, you start running into other people, <laughs> trouble. You know how the Bible always uses the body image? I mean, think of the hand is not complete without an arm, right? The eyes are not complete without the brain to interpret the signals. The heart is not complete without the veins and the arteries. Are you with me? I mean, you get the point. That a part all by itself doesn't do anything. It's when it, these parts come together that you have something. You can picture it in, if you don't want the body image, I'll, I'll give you the music image. Picture a choir. None of the parts are complete without the other parts. Or think of another way. The string section is not complete without the percussion and the woodwinds and the, that's the thing. Let me say it differently. Completeness requires unity. Let me say it that way. Completeness requires unity. Well, let's keep going to the next one because we got to keep, keep moving here. They've got to keep moving. Uh, yeah, as a result, we're no longer be children tossed by the waves. In other words, once you get to that level of maturity, that won't happen. But speaking the truth in love, we're supposed to grow up into all aspects. To him as with the head, being fitted together, and there's the whole body part that we just talked about, the whole body thing we put together. So the ultimate purpose, of course, is the building up of himself in love, right? Love is always kind of the highest thing. And if you pay attention... This unity thing and love are tied together over and over and over again in all these scriptures. Just kind of keep that, keep that in mind. Unity is a component of love. When we say that love is our highest goal, part of what we're saying is that we want to be unified with people. Not all people, that's impossible. But there's got to be a group of us that work together in harmony for the cause of Christ. That's part of maturity. And to say, oh, I can never do what she does uh, or I could, for me, he's a little hard to take, but I see his value in the body. So I'm going to put his needs ahead of my needs. That's maturity. That's getting there. And so the other thing I want you to see is unity is not some secondary thing. It's a main thing, like faith, hope, and, and, and love. To be in Christ, to be like Christ, you have to be part of a unity. I mean, Jesus is part of unity, isn't he? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Just like the sequoia, you can only grow to full stature of the measure of Christ as part of a group. Just like the sequoia can only grow to its full stature as part of a group, so too is it the way with Christians. Let's go to, let's go to Philippians. We've got to hustle. Let's go to Philippians. Get in there. If 
therefore there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, there's that love again, right? Any fellowship in the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, if any of this stuff is going on, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Let's, let's go to that level. Maintain the same love, united in spirit, there's our word, intent on one purpose, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one more important, one other more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own interests, but the interests of others. That's so basic. That's that next level. If you guys are already showing some love and compassion and, and affection, and let's go all the way and let's be unified. The point, the point in this passage is this is the way to, to um, unity. Go ahead and put it up. Unity is achieved through humility. This is how you get there. This is so hard to humble ourselves to the point that we think other people are more important than us. Even the ones that kind of rub us the wrong way. Even the ones we don't quite appreciate their gifts in quite the way that may be. I'm going to go ahead and skip the next part, just keep moving. But it goes on to say that Jesus was so humble, he gave himself to the cross. This humility is a deal of, 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 of Jesus here. All I want to say is that humility is the path to this thing called unity that's so important to Jesus. So, and I'm going to say this real quick because I always say it every time I get up here. But you know, only one place in all of Scripture does Jesus describe himself. Do you guys know that? He names himself all the time. Son of man, the true vine, the door, the shepherd that lays down his life, the way, the truth, the life, the resurrection life. He, he has a lot of names. But only one time does he describe himself, what he's like. Do you guys know the passage? I need to go up here a lot more often then. It's in Matthew 11. And this is what Jesus says. The only time, literally, in the whole Bible that we see him describe himself. Outsiders describe him. He's amazing. But here, Jesus is talking, said, this is who I am. And this is what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. That's Jesus. And you can think of me and other things about Jesus, but that's what he, chose us, that's what he chooses to say. That's who I am. And if you think about it, those are the exact two things we read about in Ephesians that make for, 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 for unity. With all humility and gentleness, with great patience. And then here, Paul emphasizes the humility aspect. You want to be mature, you want to be like Jesus, and, and, and you want to get to unity, it starts with humility. That's, that's the big sort of command, if you want to say, say it that way. I also like to tell people, no, no, this is no extra charge. No extra charge. This is, I know you paid a lot to get here, but now this is free. If you want to be like Jesus, just start right there. Gentle and humble and hard. Just start there. Watch what happens. It's going to take one thing or reliance on the Spirit like you've never had before. Okay, let's keep going. We've got to finish. Speaking of Jesus, let's hear his very words on the subject of unity. Please put up John 17. Jesus is praying. Um, and i got to read a couple verses before this. So help me out here because I put the wrong verses up. That wasn't Mitchell's fault. It never is. It's my fault. John 17. I'm going to read verses 20 and 21, and then we'll pick it up. Jesus is praying. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, talking to who's in front of them, but for, but for those who believe in me through their word. So I'm asking not for these guys, but everybody in the future. That they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. That the world may believe that you did send me. Here it goes. And the glory which you've given me, I've also given them. So that they may be one. Just as we are one. I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity. That's how you get to be complete. Until you have that unity package, you're not perfected yet. So that the world may know that you sent me and you love them just as you love me. That's Jesus. That's his very words on, on this subject. And it's so important, he's praying for it. All the commentaries I read to that prayer has not been answered. Just a second. So again, notice again how unity is tied to, to love, how it's tied to maturity. It's all the same kind of complex, just different ways of kind of, kind of, kind of look, looking at it. Um, let's go ahead and put up the unity is critical for evangelism. Did you catch that phrase? That the world may know. 
And you can add in issues to that. It's the same thing, just in a cross-cultural context. How does the world know who we are? Can you imagine somebody coming into this church and we're so clearly unified, we're not the same, and we're so clearly unified that they feel it. I mean, few things are as an attractive as a unified group. Few things prove better God's grace is among us than when we're unified. Would you agree with that? Few things. The truth is, being unified is hard. Husbands and wives fight. Fathers and sons fight. Brothers and sisters fight. Is it any, any matter that semi-strangers fight? You see what I'm saying? I mean, that... Just, I mean, Abers fight. Can we get to the point where we're not doing that? That's what Jesus would pray. Because <laughs> he knew we couldn't do it. He's praying, God, you got to do something. Because they're not going to do it on their own. It's impossible. Let's go one last one. Psalm 133. Totally different take on this. Hang with it. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to live together in unity. This is payoff. Everything before was how to get there, what it means, how it relates to Christ's likeness. Facts. This is the payoff. It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard as on Aaron's beard, the oil which ran down the edge of the robes. Now, that doesn't really move us a lot, but I'll explain that in a second. I mean, we're thinking, I don't want any oil running down my robe. We don't even wear robes. Who wears a robe? Anybody wear a robe? It's certainly not, it's certainly not in public. Have you ever seen anybody wear a robe in public? That's just odd. Just saying. It's okay. I mean, you know, you live like you want to live. I'm just saying it's a lot. It gives the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For the Lord commanded the blessing there, life forever. That's a nice blessing, isn't it? Not just, not just freedom from taxes. Oh, what a blessing. Um, but life forever. This whole psalm, that's the whole psalm, is about one thing, the blessings of unity. That's the payoff. Just real quick, the oil is a sign of God's presence, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It glistens, it softens the skin, it picks up the soft sunlight, it perfumes. The dew communicates a sense of morning freshness, a feeling of fertility, that ah, things are going to grow and things are going to work. But the point is, I hope it's clear, unity is a very great blessing. If nothing else you hear this morning, hear that. That if we can get there, it's a very great blessing. So I hope and I trust this morning that I made the case that this unity thing is a big deal. Not a secondary thing. It's not important, but secondary. It's primary. It's a central thing like evangelism, missions, discipleship, truth, faith, hope, love, service, forgiveness, obedience. It's, it's in that whole complex of, of, of the big things. I, why do I say it? Because unity reflects the very nature of God. We even say triune God, do we not? And in the book of Genesis, how's it go? In the beginning there was relationship. Think about it. I'm going to close on my last page, I promise. I'm, I'm, I'm going to close this real quick because I'm skipping a bunch of stuff and that's okay. But I want to point out two ways. That was all real good. I mean, it's great. You wrote it down. We're, we're, we're hip. But I want to go just a little beyond the basics and, and, and I want to, to get to something. The two ways that we avoid community, perhaps unintentionally, I want to do, I, I, you guys are an advanced group. I don't do the, the basics with you guys. So the first way we avoid unity is that we treat people as problems to solve. That's not in your notes room. I'm just, I'm just talking. If they're different from us, we exclude them in ways that are subtle. I mean, none of us are so lame to say, well, I don't like you, so you can't come. But we have ways we exclude people. You know what I'm talking about. Subtly exclude people. Or, if the person is a real problem, not, not, not that we don't like them, but they're actually a problem, something's going on, we send them to professional counseling one-on-one, -on -one, how much easier that is than to wade through the deep waters of community with that person. That's what we do. That's one way we, we, avoid it. we treat people as problems to be solved or avoid them. A second way we avoid uh, community, just as common, is we turn the church into an institution. And here, we are not treat we're not treat people on the basis of relationship, but on their function. You've seen this in churches. I'm not saying our church does it. I'm saying this is what happens. The, the goals are set that will motivate the largest number of people. We set these goals. And then structures are, de are developed to achieve those goals through organization and planning. And then when the plans and goals and, and, and all that are put, put together and, and the structures, they become the basis by which the church is evaluated. 
And we just avoided unity. And that way the church becomes less about community, where people actually pay attention to each other, and more about collectivism, where people are contributing units. This is advanced stuff, I'm, I, but I think you can hang with me here. So here's the, here's the church, the risk that every church faces. Either we see others as problems to be solved, like we might repair a car, or we see others in terms of institutional effectiveness, like we might run a bank. You see how unity is so easily avoided? That's how we do it. Somewhere in between is community. Somewhere in between is a place where each person is taken seriously and learns to trust others, to be compassionate with others, and rejoice with others, and learns those kind of things. My last thing. So besides humility, how do we get there? Because humility is absolutely required. But I'm going to add, add, add another one, because I think it's in there without expressing it. It's just faith, and here's what I mean by that. An ever-renewed expectation in what God is doing with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't label anybody. We refuse to predict. We see each one as specially loved and particularly led by the Spirit. And also, too, this is that's a different, maybe a different stage, maybe, than we are. Don't give up on people. They, they, they're, on this, they're on the path. They just maybe 15 yards behind and got to climb a hurdle or two to get there. I mean, how can I, how can I presume to make conclusions about anyone? How can I pretend to know a person's worth or their place in God's economy? How can I know that? Instead, why don't I just humble myself and let them be them, guide them, they guide me, interact with them and wade through the waters. A community of faith flourishes when we look at each other with a sacred expectation, wondering what God will do with each one. And while we wait for God to do his thing, because sometimes it takes a while, we exercise great humility, gentleness, and patience. That's the deal. Living together in a way that evokes the glad song of Psalm 33, 133, isn't it great in the wonderful oil do? It, living that way is one of the great and formidable tasks before us. Nothing requires more energy and, and attention. It's the hardest thing. It's far easier to see people as problems to be solved or cogs in our church machine. And that's what I'm encouraging us not to do. But if we can be humble and then summon the faith and the humility and the patience to do it, we might be able to enjoy the blessings of unity. Then they're great indeed. So I want you to do me a favor real quick. On your outline there, even if you didn't take notes, the last thing I put there is what I want you to remember about unity is, just write something down. Anything you want to write. The one thing I, that you're going to remember about unity, just write it down. That's important. It's required for maturity. Whatever, that takes humility, whatever. If you could write that down. And as you're writing that down, thanks for writing it down. I, I see a lot of you writing. I, I, I appreciate it. I hope and trust this morning that God's word has inspired us to think about unity in a new and, and, and fresh way. It's not something I think about all the time, time either. I usually focus on the, the silos. Faith, hope, love, obedience, service, prayer. But this unity is the... Unity is practically the goal of discipleship. The highest we can reach this side of, of, of heaven. So just remember, the reason why Jesus shares his glory with us, it said in the, in the, in the John 17, he shares his glory with us that we may be one so that the world may know. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, um, we are asking for your grace right now. And just as my opinion, this church is, is, is pretty unified. It's one of the better ones. Um, but there's always um, more and more to, to, to become the full stature of the measure of Christ. That that's what it takes. That you were one from the beginning with the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you, you three in one, it's too, too much for us to handle. But I pray that we could head that direction, that we pull together, that we have the humility to consider others more important than ourselves and the faith to believe that that other person who might rub us the wrong way is your work in progress and that we could see in that way. That's my prayer. 
Give us your glory that we might be one so the world may know. Amen.